very much affected by all this uh, COVID-19, the bad news and all that, right? So um, I've taken a step, right, to bring smiles to, to people, right, during this difficult period, right? Why? Because there's a lot of um, negative news outside. And then we're always scrolling on Facebook, especially now we are online a lot. So we have, uh, I've decided to, instead of always um, a, a, attending and listening to all this uh, bad news, right, put smiles on people's faces as well. And therefore, in my Facebook, you'll see a lot of very funny videos, very entertaining videos that I do, just to bring smiles to people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so I, I just went to um, Jason's Facebook and I actually saw uh, like the one he posted here on, on Circuit Breaker, day 19, I think he's trying to scare <laughs> the puppies. He got two puppies, right? Yes, I got two, okay. two super duper adorable puppies. Yeah, yeah they are, uh, it's called Cookies and Cookie and Truffle. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I saw the video, yeah, it's yeah, really, really yeah. hilarious. And then I think on <laughs> day 21, uh, Jason actually exercised your vocal cords a bit. Uh, <laughs> part, yeah. singing, singing part. Okay, and uh, what is That's this right. picture on the, on the bottom right? Um, some Guinness Book of Record. Um, you want to talk about that? Yeah, sure. Okay, so thank you for introducing that to me. So um, aside from being a realtor, I'm also an author, I'm also a speaker, as well as a real estate investor. Wow. So my book is called The Book on Real Estate. Essentially, it's seven steps, right, to help um, my friends and my family um, from the day they think about real estate to the day they actually own and open the doors into their home. So it's a very elaborate seven steps that cover all fields. Something that I will be touching a little bit on today as well. Yeah. Okay. So essentially, um, my book um, is, is published, it's going to be published in Canada. And so what happened is that uh, the publishers actually chose uh, 126 authors worldwide, right? to participate in a Guinness Book of World Records event. So that, that lady you see there, over there, the sweet lady is my fiance. And we oh. actually went to Canada uh, uh, for the record setting event. So nice. I believe I'm the only uh, Singaporean that is over there. So it's a complete wow. privilege and an honor. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Jason is doing Singapore proud. So if you uh, <laughs> think that uh, Jason is doing great, can you just type 333 into the chat group? Thank you so okay. much. Thank you so much for your kind words, Paul. Cool, cool, cool. So, um, I think Jason, not only, I mean, being your favorite realtor, he, he brings smiles on Facebook during this COVID time and stuff, right? But actually, um, can I just know, for, for COVID, how has it affected you um, um, really? I mean, as a real estate business. Yeah. Well, um, that's a very good question. Um, I believe, like, just like everyone else, we are all very uh, adversely affected, right? But thankfully, because of um, how, uh, maybe I share a little bit about how the real estate industry is like, mm -hmm. right? Where a, a lot of time when we uh, sell a piece of property or, or, or we, call, we call close a deal, right? Um, the commissions isn't in immediately. Sometimes it can take three months, six months, or even more than a year. Mm -hmm. So very much so, thankfully, last year I did pretty well. So... Uh, a lot of the, the income is actually coming in this year, which mm -hmm. enables me to be able to plan out and stagger my expenditures more effectively so that I'm not so adversely affected. Mm -hmm. But speaking of which, one of the things that also we, uh, a lot of us needs to think about is how, how is this going to affect us in the future over the next year? Because just like now, I will have uh, uh, income because of last year. If we don't do well this year, right, it will affect us next year when everybody is recovering. Yeah. So that's one thing that is, um, I guess, is a pro and a con as well like as, as a realtor in terms of our income. So there must be some uh, careful planning and some forward planning also um, in, in this line of job. Huh? For you. Yes, exactly, exactly. In fact, sometimes I tell my friends about the five, uh, actually six different bank accounts that I have. Okay, right to okay. properly discipline myself to split my uh, 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 spending into very specific uh, bank accounts. Is that using right? the fixed so, money jack? jack uh, yes, 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 exactly, okay. exactly. Okay, cool, yeah. Cool. So I, 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 do it, I do it in practice a lot and that enables me to plan out very strategically and uh, in a very disciplined format. Because I started off uh, when I was 19 years old, 
um, I, I went for my first ever course, right, that taught me this particular concept, which I was so in love with, yeah. right? And ever since then, I cultivated a very good uh, investing habit. Right? And then subsequently, I, I went on to, I, I was very much taught in the value investing uh, uh, format. So that's how I, I help my clients as well. I yeah. see, wow. <laughs> and uh, coincidentally, I met Jason a few years back in a program called Money and You. Um, yes. Introduced by our mutual friend, uh, Ivan, who is also a co-founder of Ultimate Investing. So, yeah, so, so it's very, very interesting. But uh, Jason, um, be, prior to this, right, like, let's say if you go back to the previous crisis in 2008, uh, what were you doing and did you encounter similar um, hardship? You want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. Well, I'm very, very thankful and very grateful because I was not very much affected by the, the previous recession. Even though uh, looking at the news, right, we already can see and feel how people are fearful, right? The, the, the negative vibe and feeling uh, is always, it, it's something that is very hard to forget, you know, during that period where a lot of people are losing their jobs, right? Families are affected, family, uh, uh, friends are affected as well. But thankfully, I'm not affected because back then, I was in the army. Oh, they call it during the school, right? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Okay. So thankfully, not, not, not much things happen, right? Okay. But I always tell people that um, it's, it's this 2020 is something that inspires me deeply because it's, it's a beginning, to me, it's a beginning of a new decade where we are in full control of everything that's going to happen, right? From, to, from 2020 to 2030. Right, so I think that um, one thing I always tell myself is that uh, some, some wise men told me la, that um, when good times is happening, right, we, we tend to forget that the bad times will come. Right? It happens to the best of us. Right? And during bad times that time, we tend to forget the good times will come back on. Oh, yeah. okay. So that's the reason why I want to remind people that always put a smile on your face and enjoy yourself and enjoy life. <laughs> so so I've been um, Jason being a very positive person always forward planning and stuff like that so uh, although this COVID-19 is affecting you but you actually mm. uh, have some plans to, to actually uh, make it better and stuff you want to share with us uh, how you're going to do that sure okay so as of now because a lot of uh, uh, one thing for sure that we will be living in a very very different world after this period of time so uh, I urge you, uh, uh, the audience, right, to actually note and, and take notice uh, of how people are behaving differently, right, and how businesses will be, will be changing their business model as well. And in time to come, specific to the real estate industry, people have been and will be purchasing property without even looking at the property anymore. Why? Because there's an abundance of information in the market right now. There's so much data and so much uh, 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 information in the market. But it is an essential period of time uh, where people like myself is able to collate all this information and then churn it out in terms of valuable data that people is able to accept. Then once the data is accurate, a lot of things uh, are, are very much done digitally. Say, for example, just about two weeks ago, I was also interviewed by this uh, group of university students where they are actually working really, really hard to bring in augmented reality and virtual reality into home purchases as well. So in time to come, technology will bring uh, things forward and will, bring, uh, will give us a whole new, uh, uh, will bring the whole world into another unrecognizable place. So what I would... Uh, uh, urge everyone to do, right, is to be prepared and be educated in what's to come, right? So, okay. yeah, that's, that's some of the things that I like to share. Wow, wow. And, oh, Sounds very interesting. And I think uh, you have some um, educational um, slides that, that you can share with us. Yes, yes, yes okay. I do. So, okay. um, maybe uh, I yeah. can share the screen for you. That would be good. Okay, let's see. Okay, we are seeing, if you can see Jason's uh, uh, screen, can you just type in uh, 111 into the chat group? I can see, so I think most of y'all can see it. Okay, perfect. 
Let me just change the display. Um, okay. Just checking with the Can audience. You see? Okay, so the introduction has been done. Yep. <laughs> I, I hope you guys know me well enough. Okay, so this is the book, the book on real estate. And essentially, the seven steps is what I call the freedom model to making your most valuable decision right. All right? Now, so one of the key questions, uh, you guys are able to see? Yes. They have is the slide change already? On. Not yet. Still at introduction though. Oh, wait. Uh, okay. Mm. Or maybe you're going to stop. Okay, yeah, change. Oh, there you go. Okay. So one of the biggest, so this is the book, lah, just uh, in case any, uh, you guys haven't caught it yet. Right, so this will be the book that I'll be publishing uh, uh, that has won the, the Guinness Book of World Record. And then, so one of the biggest question is whether or not is this a time to wait and see, right, uh, on the market. So one of the things that I always tell people about real estate why Singapore is because of two criteria. The first one is a criteria on defensive play, meaning to say, how does Singapore fare in terms of um, the downside protection? Now, if you look at the comparing the first world countries around the world, Singapore, London, Vancouver, Tokyo, Hong Kong, Singapore is one of the most boring lines that you'll see. <laughs> it is very unexciting, but it's very reassuring. Why? Because people generally don't lose money as long as they, may, they are able to have a certain amount of holding power. Simply because the land uh, pie in Singapore is very small. Alright, so it's, next. Another thing that we need to talk about and need to understand is about how Singapore can outperform other countries in good times. So we spoke a little bit about downside protection. Next is upside potential. Okay, I would like to share with you guys and, and allow you to take interest in this. Of course, we all understand what GDP is. Essentially, is the gross domestic product or in, in, in layman terms, the purchasing power of the country. Yes. Right? So in generally, the rule goes like this. When purchasing power goes up, prices of real estate will go up as well. Why? Because when people are able to purchase more and afford more, buyers are willing to buy at a higher price. Sellers have the guts and the tenacity to increase prices as well. Logically speaking, uh, when GDP grows, property prices should grow. So notice the only country that wins Singapore is China because they recently opened up. Right? So over the years, they've grown a lot significantly, over the, especially the last uh, 10 to 15 years. This one we all know. Now, Singapore is close second. Now, but notice this. In this study done by UOB, UOB Global Economics, right? since 2011, where the market started recovering from the last crisis, now notice this is called the relative value of Singapore real estate private real estate specifically. We are comparing the same number of nations, New Zealand, Hong Kong, China, Malaysia, Beijing, uh, Australia, and all this. These are some of the, the, the world's uh, countries. Singapore is the only country that dropped in price. Now, why is this phenom phenomenon so unique for only Singapore? If you see, uh, since 2011, every other country has been rising in prices, especially places like Hong Kong, go up like crazy. And then people are rioting and going crazy over property prices. Yep. What is the difference? The key point is all these cooling measures, which I'll just touch on a little bit, right? But all these cooling measures only can happen because of a very, very, very strong governance. Without a strong governance and a stable government, right? When cooling measures are implemented, what are cooling measures? Essentially, they, it's, a, it's, a, it's policies done by the government to actually bring down taxes, sorry, bring, a, bring down prices right. by increasing taxes, yeah. as well as decreasing the ability for people to purchase property. Yeah. So can you imagine the economy of the price from going ahead, like, uh, overheating? Yes, overheating, precisely. Mm. But this happens only this will only happen uh, if the government is strong. 
Because imagine if in any other country, with 10 cooling measures or 10 times, uh, they try to increase taxes and all this. In any other country, right, this government would be voted out already. <laughs> okay. You know what I mean? Me too. But only in Singapore, because we are very much accustomed to guai guai and listen. Why? Because we know that our government is doing things that is good for us. Yep. And that's the only reason why you see Singapore, the prices has significantly dropped and only recently started recovering. Mm. All right? Yep. Yep. Now, so uh, my book has seven steps, but in the interest of time, right, I will talk a little bit of some, uh, something that are more interesting that doesn't require much uh, time and effort. Right, to explain. So the first thing that I want to talk about is step two. F, the, the whole freedom model is F-R-E-E-D-O-M. Step two is R, where you talk about resources. For in this market, whether or not you think that it is the best time to purchase right now or to purchase in three months, six months, or after the recession, the key important point that you have to know is resources or financing. That means to say what? Your purchase price. To understand the disposable cash that you, you, you need to uh, put down for down payment, the disposable amount of CPF that you're able to uh, deploy. And lastly, most importantly, because we work with uh, up to 16 different financial institutions right, in Singapore in regards to financing. This means getting the best interest rates. And interest rates, by, by the way, effective rates uh, can go as low as one3 Right, mm. and for me, I was very lucky because I, um, um, like I mentioned, right, it's, it's a good time. So just in February, I just paid for my, uh, an investment property as well. So you realize it's not, it's not that we are just talking. It's actually there are opportunities in the market. So, to understand, uh, your purchasing power, it takes time. For me, I when I just signed, I was very lucky, right, because when I just signed on the. The, the loan, right? Uh, the effective spread uh, is only 0.2%. Wow. And then, and the interest rate for Cyborg right now has dropped to about 0.7%. So effective interest rate for my property, right, is actually only 0.9 to 1%. Less than 1%. Yeah. Crazy low. Crazy, crazy low. Yep. Because just a year ago, it was 2.1%. Yep. Yeah, it's double. I mean. So it's very scary. <laughs> Right, so to understand which is the, to understand your disposable cash, CPF, as well as your loan, to find out very essentially your purchase price. This is a two-week process. It can take up to two weeks, right? Only when you understand exactly how much are you able to deploy, then you can look for good opportunities. Similarly, like, like when you're purchasing shares or REITs, you have to know exactly how much you have before you deploy at the perfect time. Yes. Right? Okay. Now, so I'll go on to step six, skipping the few middle points, right? On opportunity, which what I call the five R's. The five R's model, right, come from these five right things to do. The first one is selecting the right region. We have already understood that Singapore is a good market with good downside protection and a very high uh, upside potential. Because why? It's like, imagine this, this uh, uh, analogy where you're pushing a, bu uh, a basketball right down into a swimming pool with the, all these cooling measures. Right? Sooner or later, right, there will be, when the opportunity comes, it will revert. It will correct upwards. Right? So we have already selected region as in Singapore, the first R, the right region. Right? Then next is the right district. So Singapore is spread into many different districts, such as District 19, 15, all the way uh, up to 23, 24 and all that, right? So selecting the right district. Then the third one is a very uh, important one where you select the right development on which development is good in that particular district. And furthermore, more importantly, is how do you select the right unit? right? The right unit for any development. Mm -hmm. So it's very essential to, to understand uh, more of this, uh, these four things. And lastly, the last one uh, is the right timing. But understand, the right timing does not mean that you can predict the right time. Because trust me when I tell you this, 
anyone that tell you that this is the perfect time to purchase real estate or REITs or shares, right, is probably telling you nonsense. Because we don't know why, when exactly will be the best time. But what we can do is to understand how people behave, right? Um, so the, for this part, if you notice, uh, in the past, when there is SARS as well as the swine flu, as, at the same time, du during this period is the, the uh, Lehman Brothers crisis. The period of time, if we put into perspective of how these viruses affect us, uh, is a very short period of time. But the moment it recovers, it doesn't ever look back. You see, the moment it recovers, it doesn't ever look back. So why do I want to talk about timing? It's very counterintuitive because why? When you look for the perfect time to purchase property, right? Or uh, at, least, at least for property, uh, I want you to take a note at this. We always want to go for the lowest possible point, which is somewhere here, if we can. Or somewhere here. Do you agree with what I say? Yep. If possible. But it's very unlikely that we are able to catch the bottom. So I'd like you to notice this. The newest, this you might want to note this down. The new high will always be higher than the the new high will always be higher than the old high. A new low will always be higher than the old low. Additionally, if you notice, during the last downward cycle, if, even if you're able to predict the specific moment to purchase a piece of real estate, if I were to draw a line over here, as straight as I can, the lowest possible moment is still the same or higher than the previous highest point. This enables me to understand that no matter how you go, no matter how much you do your best to pick the, the lowest point, it is pretty much a little bit pointless. Why? Because you can never catch it. And even if you catch it, it will still be higher than the previous highest point. Hmm. Do you see what I mean? Yes. Very now, interesting. Hmm. So this is one of the things that I studied in terms of property volume. And it's something that I really feel that is essential. Hopefully, I do have enough time. Maybe I'll just take two more minutes. Sure, sure. All right? So there are four different stages in property purchase and how people generally behave when you talk about purchasing property. Stage one, if we look at the last property cycle, stage one is the time where the recession just happened. Anytime if you were to tell people to purchase shares, properties, or any investment product, most people, aside from the savvy investors, will say you're crazy. Right? <laughs> because it's the recession. How can I purchase anything? Doesn't make sense. But logically, that's the best point. Now, when we go to stage two, during stage two, when the market begins to recover, right? When the market begins to recover, Will people purchase at this point of time? Reasonably, based on study, the volume is low over here as well. Why? Reason is because at stage two, I believe many of you might have heard this thing before. People will say that it is not a bottoming out point yet. I believe you have heard of this before. Yeah. So when this happens, people don't make decisions at this time. And thirdly, at stage three, at this point, this is the time where people always say it is too expensive. Because why? The cycle is over. But ironically, the volume is highest always at stage four. Where people purchase property. Why? Because good times has been happening over the last three or four years. Bonuses are increasing. Salary is increasing people start to have more money, more savings, then the itchy hand comes with it. That's the worst time to purchase and that's exactly where the volume comes from. So throughout this entire time, my, aside from bringing smiles onto people's faces, what I'm doing my best to do is to stop this from happening. When everybody go in, do not go in. So it's essential for all value investors as well. 
Yep. Right? People who look for a good deal. Instead, go in when places look like that. Okay? I believe I think it's quite uh, 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 some time already. So uh, there, there are definitely uh, chances I can talk about uh, picking the right unit as well. But I think I'll leave it all to uh, uh, another time. Uh, in the essence of time, like, I've taken like, I think 20 minutes already. <laughs> I think it's, right. it's, so, it's, yeah. Yeah, so I think it's, it's very, very good, good sharing. Um, so if you think that this is valuable, can you just type in 888 into the chat group? I'm quite sure I will see a lot of 888s coming up in the chat group. Thank you, and, Hansai. Thank yeah. you, Victor. Wow, Amanda, Edmund, Joshua, thank you so much. Yeah. Everyone. Yeah. So, so this is this is very very interesting, and frankly, um, now I can understand why um, Jason can do so well because um, of so many <laughs> thank you, thank you for your that I have met <laughs> met before, right? I mean, uh, he is really really knowledgeable. I mean, I seldom see someone who actually use value investing techniques, and not only that, he use trend lines, which is what we do in investment also, to actually pick the good time and also pick the good good. Uh, a situation to actually own the property. So there's a lot of knowledge into that. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to quickly touch on on what um, Jason has talked previously before. So I think this chart is pretty um, repetitive already. And you can see that um, basically, as Jason mentioned, TDSR is the main thing that has actually curbed the pricing and it has come down uh, a bit. But you can see that even with TDSR um, playing in, um, the price starts to creep up again at near to uh, June uh, 2018. And that's why the government actually starts the third round of uh, ABSD. Jason, can you just elaborate a little bit about the ABSD, the third round? What, what was the measures for this? Well, sure. So the third round of ABSD, right, is actually where uh, Texas additional buyer stamp duty has increased by a 5%. Right, not just for buyers, actually, uh, it's targeted towards developers. Why? Because in 2017, right, there is actually a lifting of cooling measure where the government actually take out one small aspect of cooling measure, which uh, some of you might be familiar with, where they remove the seller's stamp duty by a year. Previously, if you were to sell a piece of property after the first year, it would be 16% tax. Right? And, uh, and then 16%, uh, 12%, 8%, 4%. But they remove one year out of it. So it becomes 12%, 8%, and 4%. So you can sell on the fourth year instead of the fifth year. Just this small lifting of cooling measure, right? Can you see how much heated demand there was? Yeah, it's, it's uh, right after spike. 2017. Yeah. Immediately there was a spike. Correct. Wow. And the government realized, right? that, okay, there is a lot of demand. So we have to cool it back down because we cannot allow the prices to spiral up too quickly. Mm -hmm. That's why we always, always say, I think Singapore government right, is both powerful and very responsible. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Okay. Yes. So the last time I checked, right, I think uh, at the moment, uh, this chart is until 2018, but in 2020, now we are roughly, we're still higher at this point, we're roughly at about, 155 uh, on the index, so still higher. So very, very interesting. Um, next, I'm going to just touch a little bit about um, how you can invest in the property industry. So, so I generalize it in three ways. Of course, um, Jason has talked about um, getting an investment property and that is his expertise. So if you look at it, I categorize it in such a way that there's actually um, five different um, um, methods or should I say five, sorry, five different criteria that you should look at. Firstly, the capital outlay, um, ability to use leverage, liquidity, diversification, and also knowledge and skill. So just as like what Jason has talked to you in that short 15 minutes, right? He really teach you the six steps and he got no time to tell you uh, all of them. Just very briefly. And you find that for well, that six steps, that there needs to be a, a lot of knowledge and skills to, to actually buy a property. Um, the shortcut is actually get Jason's help. Uh. If you have Jason's help, <laughs> then you'll make your, your job very easily. So in terms of investment property, the capital outlay is generally higher. Okay, you need uh, a few hundred Ks uh, even for the down, down payment. 
Um, the good thing is leverage is, is high. You can actually borrow from the bank at quite a reasonable rate. So that is the good part. But um, with the um, cooling measures being implemented, right? So I understand from Jason, the first property that you can buy now, you can only take up to 75% loan. And for a second uh, investment property, you can only loan up to 45%. So, uh, which is very different from last time where you can own up to 80% of the, of the loans. So, um, that greatly reduced the buying power of people in this case. And then, um, if you look at liquidity, um, it takes time to buy a property. And of course, even when you try to sell it, it also takes some time. So, in terms of liquidity, uh, it's, like, it's, it's lower compared to, let's say, a property stock. Okay. Um, diversification is where the knowledge comes in. You need to really know what you're buying. Location, location, location. Right? I think Jason can not emphasize more than that. You must find the right location to, to buy. So um, in terms of if you pick the wrong location, then your property appreciation will probably be not as good. So that's the skill set you need to do. So now I'm going to just jump to uh, uh, two other parts, uh, which is REITs and property stocks. Okay. So... Um, in terms of capital outlay, both of them are generally lower because uh, you can uh, buy buy a share with a few few hundred and few few thousand dollars. It's, it's, you can start with that. Uh, leverage, I would say, is low. Although I mean, there are people who borrow money to buy shares, but I say no, please don't do that. It's very risky, and uh, if you 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 lose all, and uh, if you borrow right, you get into a big trouble for that. Um, in terms of liquidity, the good thing is uh, both REITs and property stocks are actually higher liquidity. You can trade it on the exchange platform. So that's quite easy to, to do that. Um, diversification, I would say probably if you buy a REITs, which is, um, um, will be more diversified than just um, buying into a single property stock. Okay. In terms of knowledge and skill, like just now you heard Jason talk about buying property, you need that knowledge. Um, buying a REITs, generally, the skill level, I think, is compared to looking for good property stock is slightly easier, okay? But um, we got no time to really go into REITs per se. But what happened was yesterday in our um, UI community, what happened was our co-founder, Ivan, actually did a whole two-hour session on REITs, talking about which REITs to buy and even invited a, a speaker from Sydney to actually talk about which so um, they are a very very in-depth discussion about that but today my main focus is actually going to talk about property stocks but I'm I know a lot of people will be interested in me so I'm going to talk a little bit about it but first I before I go into any stocks and stuff I need to put a disclaimer so whatever we, we talk about here is a case study so uh, it doesn't constitute into any advice to buy a share or sell a share okay so um, please take that into uh, account. So about REITs, um, Jason, have you bought, bought some REITs before uh, previously? Um, yes, I have. Um, okay. However, I'm quite out of touch in terms of the REITs market. Uh, I'm still holding on to some, but it's, it's okay. all uh, uh, holdings that I've purchased many, many years ago. I because see. like I mentioned, I started off with, uh, I started off with uh, investing in yes in uh, value investing. Correct. Yeah. So yes, I do still have some of them. Yes. Yeah. And so, they, of course, course, they are generating good, good returns. <laughs> good yeah, that's good. Yeah. yeah. But I think Jason has now wholeheartedly put his energy and, um, and interest into to, to the, the property market. So uh, all his skill sets uh, has been um, uh, um, honed into to, to this trade. But for yes, me, that's right. right. <laughs> yeah. So for me, as a REITs investor, I also invest in REITs, right? Um, there's three things I like about them. They give regular payout every year or every half yearly. So that's the, the, the good thing about it. Um, fairly easy to eva evaluate compared to looking at stocks, I would say. Okay. So um, we find that um, for, um, um, you can look at the price to NAV. So that's one, one of the matrix. You can look for dividend yield because you, you generally um, do that for income. And then... Uh, the, the, the third part is looking for sustainability and growth. So this is a bit more tricky. Like I said, um, uh, Ivan spent about two hours talking about REITs with our uh, uh, community members, how to pick the right REITs and stuff. So um, that's something we each can share uh, in the next session or something like that. Um, diversification. So REITs uh, allow you to have diversifications 
um, along the area. But um, three things I don't like about REITs. Okay, so first thing is there is this thing called what we call a rights issue. Okay, rights issue is actually what I call a license to get money from the shareholder. So you are usually placed in a cash 22 situation. And rights issue usually happen when? About time like now. Like COVID-19, when they have um, dropped in their income and stuff like that, and they have difficulty borrowing from the banks, okay, they will actually reach out to the shareholders. So what happened is, um, if you don't subscribe to the rights, you will lose out on share dilution. But if you subscribe to it, you have to count with more money and uh, you may not actually uh, make, make more money from that. So that's one thing I don't like about REITs. Okay, so and um, limited gain, I would say, well, 5 to 10% dividend per year may sound very good to, to, to some people. Okay, but because at Ultimate Investing, right, um, the, the strategies that we use right, can actually bring us easily 5 to 10% per month. So this, in a way, is like restricting uh, the, the, the upside. So, so that's something. Um, but of course, I would say that REITs is a very good, stable investment for the, uh, if you think about your portfolio as a pyramid, this is the bottom of it where it gives you very stable income and you can invest your money in it. Okay, and the last thing, I don't know whether you, you guys agree with me, REITs actually, to me, make things expensive. Why I say that? Okay, example, for REITs to make money, right? They have to keep increasing the distribution uh, DPU to, to people. So when DPU needs to go up, it means that the rent they charge to the, to the residential or to the commercial or the um, uh, retail needs to be higher. So things will generally become more expensive. So it's a way how things work. So it will slowly go, if it slowly go up, I think people won't complain, but if it's spike too much, uh, you have a problem. So this is similarly to what Jason has mentioned previously. The property need market needs to go up at a reasonable pace, but not spiking up and stuff. Okay, so at this point in time, I think there's some questions for Jason. They say that uh, where Jason can be reached, yeah, that's Jason's number. By the way, Jason works for Procnex. So um, yeah, um, Jason, okay, I disclose that, right? <laughs> okay, so, so what's going to, Okay, can you all still hear me? I, I need some response that, 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 that you all can hear me. If you can hear me, can you just type can C-A-N into the... Into the I, sh I just changed my uh, virtual background so that I'll be, I'm easily reachable uh, for people okay. that I just... <laughs> cool, 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 cool. So now, yeah, you got Jason's number. Yes, your friendly realtor, please get to him. Okay. So what happened now is I'm going to talk about shares. Um, property stocks, but I'm gonna just talk mainly about um, okay, somebody is doing some annotation. Let me see, can that be stopped? Um, let me just try this. I will share again. Well, it happens. Okay. So we're going to talk about developers today. Okay, we're going to talk about developers today. So I look at the top five developers in Singapore. Okay, so basically these are the top five we have in this. Um, the first one is actually Capital, Capital Land. Okay, I think everybody is very familiar with uh, Capital Land and um, we have, um, they are one of the largest uh, real estate capital uh, companies in Singapore. And then uh, they actually have uh, a lot of uh, properties and a lot of REITs actually uh, for them. Okay, and they are generally one of the biggest listed um, developers in Singapore. Okay, the second one is Far East Organization. Um, they are the largest privately owned, okay. It's actually owned by um, the late Ng Ting Fong. Okay, so you will heard of Ng Ting Fong Hospital, this is named after him. So they are the biggest um, private uh, property developers in Singapore. Okay, unfortunately, it's not listed. They actually listed two of their subsidiary, the Pais Orchard and also Yo Hap Seng. Okay, so that's Pais organization. Then we have City Development. Okay, also a very big developer in Singapore. And Goko Land, okay, the four figures. So they are actually related in a way because they actually have um, what we call um, 
they are actually cousins. The parents are the the, the older generation are actually cousins. So uh, city development is actually Quickling, um, Quickling Ping, and actually Google um, Land is Quickling uh, Chan. So this uh, uh, the, uh, other companies that here from Leong. Okay, uh, Maple Tree. I didn't because I based this report uh, based on the twenty eighteen biggest developer. So uh, they are not in this list, so I, I don't know uh, where they stand. But uh, if you look at the top five, right? So Bukit Sambawang is the um, last of the of the top five that we have in, in this list. Okay. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about um, something unique about the developers in Singapore. Okay, but before that, right? What I'm doing is I'm going to do a comparison chart um, between um, Five of them. So what happened is um, this is the last series of the ultimately invest. So previously we talk about uh, the matrices, uh, one or two of them. So as a bonus to our audience for being so faithfully following us, I now talk about four matrices that to help you actually talk um tell me which one is a better developer. Okay, so um we'll talk about ROA and ROIC first. This is about efficiency. So previously, I talked about ROA talks about how assets like a company is, but in this case, um, both um, as you know, property invest uh, developers are not assets like they need to have assets like land banks and uh, properties. To so you can see that the ROA is generally not very high. Okay, but you can tell that uh, capital land is much higher than um, CBL and also GOCO land. In this case, okay, but Bukit Sambawang, okay, for some reason actually has double the ROA of capital land. So we're going to investigate that a bit later. Secondly, we talk about ROIC. So this is how efficient the management is in distributing the, um, making the capital work harder. So in this case, you can see that both capital land and Bukit Sambawang did a very good job, about five to six percent. Next, we go to this thing called net margins. So if we look at net margins, right? This is how much profit they are, they are making after uh, taking out everything. Generally, for any industry, more than 10 is better. Okay. Um, but um, in this case, right, you can see that Capital Land has a massive 34% okay, net margin. And um, Bukit Sambawang has 28%. Right? The rest, Tupo uh, Land and CDI has about 25%. Um, yeah, there's some background noise I'm hearing also, but I cannot find out the source of. Can can someone just mute their mic if they are not um, if they are on the call? Yeah, thank you so much. Okay, and the last one I'm gonna talk about is this matrix called price to book. Price to book means um, book value is basically how much assets the the company has. So anything of a price to book less than one, okay, means that is undervalued in this case. Okay, so in this case, you can see that actually all the property uh, counters are actually below price to book value. Okay, but if you can see that um, the more undervalued one are actually capital land and also um, CDL is, is quite undervalued also in this case. Okay, and Bukit Sambawang is also about 0.76, which is quite low. Okay, somebody asked about UOL Jolene. Um, again, I based on the top five, uh, they are not in the top five. So um, didn't do any uh, analysis on them, but uh, we can actually find all this uh, information right readily from this website called Morningstar. Okay, www.morningstar.com. Okay, so what I'm do here is I actually shot have uh, done a funnel and funnel down to two companies which I'm more interested in. One is Capital Land, and the other is Bukit Sambawang in this case. Okay, so. Um, the next chart I'm going to talk about can be a bit scary to a lot of people because it seems like um, a lot of things. But what I'm trying to, to show is actually what is quite unique about Capital Land is they have this thing called capital recycling. So capital recycling you can see in this chart is from the process of land purchase to approvals to construction to sell, okay, they are actually adding create value to, the, to their properties. Okay, that means uh, as they, from planning to construction to the sale, they actually increase the asset value of the property. But it is only when the 
the property is being completed, then you can actually sell it. And that's where they realize the value. So what happened with Capital Land even 10 over years ago is they have, they are the one of the first to pioneer the REITs concept. Okay, the thing about REITs, they are one. So you have Capital Commercial Trust, you've got uh, uh, Capital Mall Trust. Uh, these are the two biggest REITs. So what happened is after they built their buildings, they actually offload it to the REITs, which are actually financed by shareholders. And they take back the capital, they retain a part of the ownership of the REITs, but they take care most of their capital so that they can redeploy it and do redevelopment. So to me, this is really, really smart. And after what Capital Land has done, all the other developers actually also follow suit. But if you think about it, Capital Land at the moment is still the biggest REITs um, sponsor or they, they own the most number of REITs. They actually have seven REITs in the um, listed in Singapore. So that's what I was going to talk about um, uh, later. So you can look at here, these are the seven REITs that are being owned by Capital Land. So they have the Capital Mall Trust, they have the Capital Commercial Trust, and recently there's a merger going on with this. And they are also into industrial parts. So they have the Ascenders REITs, the, they also venture overseas into India, into China, to Malaysia, and stuff like that. And Escort, if you heard about the brand, the Escort Service um, Apartments, this is also under Capital Land. So in a way, they are very, very diversified. They have um, in retail, commercial, industrial, and hospital, hospitality. So this is something which made Capital Land the big brother. And uh, actually, I don't know whether you all know who's the um, backing be behind Capital Land. If you don't know, can you just type the answer into the chat group? Who is behind Capital Land? Okay, for those uh, who are... Um, well, no, they used to be called DBS land, capital land. So actually, you know that the government, Temasek Holdings is a major shareholder for capital land in this case. Okay, so they are actually a very, very strong company and the biggest in Singapore in terms of uh, the amount of REITs and also the amount of properties that they have. Okay, so this is something which is quite, um, put them in a very good light. Okay, and the second one, which I'm also interested to talk about is this company called Bukit Sambawang. Because if you look at the matrix that we had just now, it seems that Bukit Sambawang is doing very, very well. And although they do not have the scale of capital land, they seem to have better net margins than, than capital land and have a very high ROA. So I'm not sure what is the secret uh, behind that. Um, but what I found out is that capital, uh, sorry, Bukit Sambawang actually does a lot of niche residential projects. They are more the high end. Um, uh, so you can look at that, some of their properties. Jason, have you uh, come across any of these property or do a sale for, for any of these projects that are listed here? Yes, we are actually, uh, actually we, we are, as realtors, we are able to sell any pieces of real estate uh, mm -hmm. in Singapore, right? So that's an added advantage of being a realtor as well. Because as long as there's some uh, a piece of property that our clients is interested in, we are now readily able to assess the information prices and uh, all that is required. At the same time, we'll do a, a, a CMA, a, a competitive market analysis of the particular uh, development so that we are able to give the best advice to our clients as well. I yeah, see. So the short answer is yes, we do, cool, we cool. do some of these properties as well. Yeah, so um, I, I just saw uh, recently on the news that uh, Luxus Hills has been fully sold. And I think it's just launched a few few uh, few few months back. Yeah, so it's a landed landed housing triple nine. Um, uh, the atelier is actually a district nine uh, project. Um, also um, very 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 um, hot. And then the water cove, I think it's at uh, Sambawang facing the, the the streets. A Nim residence, I a Nim uh, collections, I think is somewhere in Amokyo Avenue five around there. So, so these are some of the properties that they have, but for some reason they, they have some, some niche, um, which um, we're still trying to, to investigate at this point in time. Okay, so at this point in time, I think we want to take some questions for both Jason and myself. If you've got any questions for Jason regarding how uh, looking for properties or any um, questions regarding uh, looking for good property developers or even REITs, you can actually ask it in the chat group. You can type it down. 
Okay. So um, in the meantime, right, I think um, if you guys are interested, what we'll do is uh, for Ultimate Investing, we will actually do uh, more in-depth studies on into Bukit Sambawang and find out what's the reason why they are so good in terms of their um, ROA and also in terms of their um, net margins and ROIC. Okay. Any questions for Jason? You guys seem to be quite shy. <laughs> Jason, <laughs> no questions for you at this point in time? Okay, so, so you know that Jason, okay, Jason, can you just advise us um, at this point in time, right? Like with the COVID-19, sure. you mentioned that uh, things are uh, not looking so good. So what would you advise your potential clients to do? I would, I would uh, as, as much as possible, as uh, I've been telling everyone this, to get ready. To get ready is the most important because uh, I, I believe a lot of things, a lot of times people make the mistake of trying to get ready only when the time is right. So I give you an example. Uh, um, just now when I shared with, us, with uh, everyone on step two, where I talk about resources, right? Yes. It, I mentioned it will take two weeks, right? Of course, you are able to get it in three days. But why do I say two weeks? It's because in order to serve my clients best, I I find out the right, uh, the best interest rate as well as the interest rate package, right? Within uh, step two, I also talk about the different uh, interest rate package, the pros and cons as well. So this is just one aspect. It will take you two weeks before you identify the best financing, uh, 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 financing uh, institution, right? Then from there, to look for a piece of property, right? It's going to take you time and effort. Why? Because there's traveling time. There is time where we need to do a CMA, right? All this will generally uh, might take a month or even two to properly identify which product to go for. If that's the case, imagine even two weeks, uh, is two weeks too long. Why? Because like uh, as, as, as I shared in one of my slides just now, the moment the crisis period is over, everything rises. There's no longer any opportunity left. And that's the reason why people wait for, once you miss the, the, the down cycle, right? The uptick, they call it. You have to wait for the next cycle. Yeah, actually, Jason, you're very right. Because um, I read some articles that um, now China, you know that China has been um, quite, um, uh, they're sort of starting to open up. And actually, they, they say yes. that uh, the, the, there's a lot of buying demand for, for properties and, and things exactly. are up very, very fast. Yeah. Very quickly. In, in fact, in one of the cities in, in, in China, right, the property prices actually went up by three times. Okay. As, of course, we are not, we are not going to expect such crazy increase, right, in terms of uh, property prices, right? We are not going to expect a three times in Singapore. Why? Because like I mentioned, we have a very solid, responsible government that won't allow prices to go up so fast. Hmm. But are we going to see something that, is, that rhymes with such a behavior? After China con uh, uh, managed to manage the situation immediately three times, can you imagine? Are we in a process of um, um, reaching that kind of, that kind of uh, recovery? We are. How long? We are not sure. That's why I keep emphasizing whether or not you think it's one month, three months, nine months, or a year and a half. The essential thing is to get yourself ready with all seven steps so that by the time you see, okay, this is the best time is going to be going to get ready. It's time to go. You are able to secure something immediately. Okay, very nice. Okay, now we've got questions coming in. Um, oh, some questions for you, some for me. Okay, let me take one first. Um, <laughs> sure. Regina is asking about Bukit Sambawang. He says that he has a strong FA from what I presented, and their, but their dividend is low. So he's asking whether it's more a capital gameplay um, rather than a dividend pay. Yeah. Okay. So Regina, for me, right, uh, when I look at why I'm interested in developers is because I'm interested in capital gain. Um, generally, developers, the, the dividend they pay won't be too high because um, they are very cyclical. The business is very cyclical. So there's the boom and then there's a the low time and then there's a the high time. But um, from a low period to a high period, right, you can see double or sometimes even more than double in terms of the price movement. Okay, example, a very good example would be CDL. If you check from the lowest to the high in any crisis to, to the peak, right, it's at least two times more. So I'm looking at capital gain in that. So dividend yield is not 
um, that important. If I want dividend yield, I will go and look for REITs. Okay, so I hope that answers your question, Regina. I um, think um, two questions from Jason. One is from Jia Hui. He's asking, is it important to buy freehold, freehold property or leasehold is fine? What's your take on that? Okay, here's my take. I think it's an excellent, excellent and a very important question, Jia Hui, on freehold and leasehold. So to understand this concept, we need to understand where freehold comes from. The freehold comes from people that are 50 or 60 or even 100 years ago when people own land long time ago and because of that, that first person that owned that piece of freehold property, whether is it the government or landowners in the past, charge a premium because of it being freehold. And that premium has trickled down many decades later and it's still a premium right now. So effectively, uh, for two pieces of property, if let's say you were to have a freehold and leasehold, you will almost always see freehold being charged at a premium. Not just because of the, the number of years. It's because of the premium that has been charged many, many years ago by the first person who owned that piece of freehold land. Now, to move on a little bit, I want to elaborate a little bit more with regards to which kind of freehold property should you get and which kind of leasehold property you should get. In my opinion, in Singapore's context, freehold properties would be good for landed properties. How so? Because you own the piece of land. What you want to do with it, whether you want to lease it out for another 30 years, you want to sell it full, or whichever you want to do, as long as you own the piece of land, it is yours, it's within your control. Now, for condominiums, this is where misconception happens. Because people already know that by owning freehold land is very valuable in time to come. But they, mis -trans they translate it wrongly to a condominium. How so? Because when you purchase in Singapore, because our land is so small, now note this, even the oldest piece of condominium, which is, one per which is Pearl Bank, the, the one that's C-shaped, that one, yeah. has already gone on block. <coughs> Oh, you got a little cute kid. <laughs> I'm trying to find out the source. Sure. Go no ahead. worries. Okay, so generally in Singapore, right, condominiums do not last very long. Why? Because it's a building and that tall building, right, cannot last for beyond 99 years. So why am I telling you this? The reason why you buy freehold is to leave the land for your next generation. That's why people purchase freehold. But if you look at it on a macro perspective, any building, even the oldest condominium, has already on block rate. Which means to say what? You will never be able to fully utilize the freehold, the value of a freehold condo. Because by the time it reaches 60, 70 years or below on block, and you no longer own that piece of property. In a way, it's a for sale. Because why? Buildings get old. Physically, the wires get eaten by rats maybe, right? The pipes get old and rusty. And then it be, swimming pools get really dirty to irreparable state. That's the reason why on block happens. And therefore, in my opinion, to purchase a freehold property, it's not so much of, it, it, it may be good, but only if the freehold prices is lower than the leasehold nearby. Yes. Right, because if you pay a premium for a freehold, you your, your yield has also dropped as well. Yes. Very because very for the same size, let's say 1,000 square feet of leasehold property versus 1,000 square foot freehold property. For the same 2,000 square feet, the yield for a freehold property is definitely going to be lesser because simply because you have opted to pay more. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Very, so very that's my opinion. Mm. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I think we've got two more questions, one for me, one for you. Um, Edmund is asking me um, if the COVID-19 uh, situation, people working from home and once business rethink, they, they may downsize and stuff like that. What is my opinion whether they will affect industrial REITs or office REITs? Um, actually, for me, my opinion on REITs is with COVID-19, you can see that the retail is being hit very badly. Uh, we can see that um, you will see that the office suites will also be hit because people will start to rethink space and stuff like that okay but i see some some spot in 
place like logistics industrial, these are places like warehousing. I think there's always a need. And let's say with the movement, uh, with the popularization of e-commerce and stuff, right? um, warehouses are still, 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 there's a demand for it. So there are some um, warehousing uh, REITs uh, in Singapore. So that, that is something which uh, I will be looking more on that. But I think office demand and um, also retail demand um, will be affected by the COVID-19. So that is my opinion. Okay, so I think um, last question from, from, from the audience um, is asking about um, Jason. Um, talking about supply and demand, um, assuming people choose to stay home to work, what will happen to the new demand supply dynamics in your opinion to residential apartments? So I think um, if I get it correctly, that means with COVID-19, now people want to have a choice to work from home and stuff like that. Do you think this will actually make a, a change to the demand uh, dynamics in the residential apartments? Okay, well, um, uh, the short answer is uh, actually if you look at um, how people live, right, even if you were to work at home, you don't exactly need additional space. So is there a direct correlation between people wanting to have uh, more residential real estate if let's say they choose to work from home? I don't think there's a a direct uh, uh, um, correlation to to this particular aspect, right? And I understand. I think from this question also touch a little bit uh, in elaboration uh, further from the previous question by Edmund, mm. right? With regards to how businesses work at home, in mm. my opinion, right? Maybe at there comes a point of time where maybe the demand will will drop for commercial industrial real estate. But the thing is. What I feel is that people would require lesser space. Mm. That means spaces will be used more efficiently. That means maybe instead of needing a, a 2,000 square feet office, maybe I only need 1,000 square feet. Yeah. But this opens up spaces uh, for another company to take that spare 1,000 square feet. Mm. So while I, I, I agree that there might be people who... Um, Downsize the office. Down people, uh, the, the prices of uh, uh, commercial and industrial will drop, but does, it does not immediately mean that the U will drop as well. Mm. And to, to, to elaborate a little bit about supply and demand, right, from Jia Hui, I think this is something that I find it's really important. Um, maybe can I just take five minutes uh, sure, sure, sure. to share? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, now, to understand the supply and demand of Singapore, right? it's important to know where, why, how much exactly the supply there is in Singapore and the demand to understand whether or not are we in a supply glut. Okay, if you go to URA website, right, this particular slide that you're looking at is the exact slide lifted from URA's website. And the available number of units unsold right is uh sorry the units sold from 2019 to 2023 the available amount is 53,000 averaging uh uh to we need to sell about 8,000 8, uh, units per year okay moving on the unsold supply as of first quarter 2019 is 38,000 because this has been updated now we are about 30, 30 to 32,000 uh, units left unsold this is the supply. Now, with to remember the supply of about thirty thousand uh, dollars, thirty thousand units. Demand uh, is as follows. In order for us to 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 maintain our economy, we definitely need to bring in people. We always know that Singapore. We always say Singapore's uh, most important resource is humans, and we need to hit a six point nine million by two thousand thirty. This, has, this is news of seven years ago news already. But why? The reason is because as of 2018, right, the, we have officially hit a aging population, which means that all those uh, six people that are, our baby boomers are, have officially crossed the retirement age already. This means that in time, there are lesser people, lesser young people supporting the elderly. In the 1970s, if you can see over here, for every one elderly, 
there is 13 people supporting. If nothing is done based on 2020, only 3.8 people is supporting one elderly. So to solve this problem to, of re reduction in our GDP, we have to increase, okay, uh, the, an update uh, uh, is that we are actually 5.81 in terms of population right now already. 5.81, this was uh, last year's number. Okay. Please uh, forgive me if I haven't updated this. No okay, so in order for us to hit a 3.9 million, sorry, 6.9 million population, roughly we would need about 150, uh, or rather 143,000 new people coming into Singapore every year. This means what? If you take 143,000 new people coming into Singapore and you divide it along according to the 3.24, which is the average household size in Singapore, which means for every house, how many people are there? About 3.24. You understand what I mean? Yeah. Right? If you take 143 divided by 3.24, all these new people, we need roughly about 44,000 new houses from 2021. Now, mm -hmm. notice, just now I mentioned, right, that the number of units left unsold is about 30 to 32,000. Yep. But the, the demand required is 44,000. So demand is still higher than supply. The demand is still higher than supply. Effectively, right, even if I'm very wrong, and the, the, the houses actually that people actually need is 20, 22,000, for example. In two to three years' time, the available housing will be gone. Hmm. So this, this, I hope to answer the question uh, of why, or, or rather how important it is to understand the supply and demand uh, of Singapore. Wow, yeah. Actually, thanks, Jason, for sharing those numbers. I mean, it's, it's, it's incredible the amount of research that's been done and, and stuff like that. So I think we're just mm -hmm. going to take one more question from Alan, for Jason again. Um, okay. Asking whether a resale property with immediate rental or a new launch, uh, which may be waiting until TOP, is more attractive as an investment property. Um, what's your take on that? Okay, so my take on to answer this question, right, depends on the investor profile. Mm -hmm. For me, myself, uh, the advice I give to my clients, right, is to be as safe as possible. Mm -hmm. Meaning to say, use the least amount of money to make the same amount of money. Mm -hmm. If you were to purchase a resale property right now, okay, so... In general, Singapore's uh, uh, private property prices rises at about 4.1 to 4.2% per annum. Okay? In the entire market, looking at holistic view, of course, not for every single piece of real estate. Assuming both growths are the same, a resale private property, right, would generate, would cost you, let's say if you were to purchase a $900,000 property, from the day you purchase that piece of property, right, as the legal owner, you need to fork out a three to four thousand monthly mortgage, right? And it's going to be over a, a number of months or number of years, right, before you choose to sell a piece of property. Now, even if you're unable to find a, a tenant during this difficult period, means to say the day you purchase a resale property, immediately you are bleeding $3,000 every month. Mm. So why do I, as compared to what I did, why did I choose to purchase a new property instead of a resale private property? Because I mentioned resale private property, immediately if I don't find a tenant in this difficult market, which is very highly likely, I will bleed immediately. But for a new piece of property, my monthly repayment, because it only started building very recently, right? My monthly repayment uh, is as low as $200 to $300. Now, mm. the difference is this. Even if I have no tenant, my monthly is a small amount of $200 to $300. I'm not bleeding a lot. But I can leverage on these $200, $300 on maybe a half a year 
a year or a year and a half, it doesn't feel very uncomfortable. And I'm not worried because I know that I will type through this period easily. So assuming both resale and new launch grows at a 4% rate, the first one, right, I may, I mean the resale, I may be bleeding $3,000 if I don't find a tenant. I'm, I'm talking about a current market conditions. I may bleed. Mm -hmm. But for the second one, I know that I'm forking out very little amount of money. So mm -hmm. you see, why I'm, I'm, I suggest do this angle is because I need to ensure that my clients, after making a decision, they have to make decision on a very safe, very secure uh, 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 investment. Wow. I do not want, it doesn't mean high risk, high return. For okay. me, it's, I spend the least amount of money, I get the same return, it makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, wow. Very, I hope very that answers good. your question, Alan. Yeah, I think that's a very, very good answer and you can tell that Jason really cares about the client and stuff. So, oh, thanks, yes. thanks so much for that. So, I think it comes to the end of our presentation. I would just like to say a very good thank you for, for you all to be a very good audience. We overrun a bit today. But um, I would just like to say that this is the end of our Ultimately Invest series. The whole idea is for people who are not new to investing to actually not be afraid and just whichever industry that you're interested in, you can actually find um, areas where you can actually invest in. So what motivates us to do this, right? At the end of it, just basically um, um, we do it for free. Um, so what happened is uh, if you all go to our Facebook page, uh, Ultimate Investing, um, you find that uh, you can leave us a comment or even just send us a message. Like uh, I received this on Wednesday, okay? Um, it's from a gentleman and he says that he likes my previous uh, Ultimately Invest Travel series and he just put a smile on my face. Okay, so we, we don't ask for much. We just look, go to our webpage, like our webpage, give us a comment or things like that. I think that would be great. And I think for Jason, I can see that he has a big heart. If you guys want to um, know more about how to choose the right property and stuff, I think he's the guy to go to. Uh, contact thank him on so Facebook and he has left his contact number. Okay, so I think, um, thank you very much. And for all that, can we just have a, 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 a clap for Jason for being such a, a good uh, sharing with all of us. Can we just type clap, C-L-A-P and 777 into the chat group. Okay, so Jason, thank, thank you, so you so much, much for your everybody. time. And uh, I the think we all really enjoyed this. And uh, we hope to, to actually invite you again to have another series to talk, to talk more in depth, actually. So of let's, course, let's of course, please. That. Okay. Of course. At any point of time, please, please, thank you so much for being such a great audience. Mm -hmm. I really had a good time enjoying sharing today. Uh, at every point of time, if you wish to reach, me, reach out to me, my number and my uh, Facebook, Instagram is over here. Thank you so much. Really appreciate your, your time and your friendship. <laughs> okay, cool. So everybody, please stay safe. COVID, um, stay at home. Um, we don't want another extension. And yeah, first soon, <laughs> yeah. everything will be back to normal. Okay. Okay, thank you, guys. We will see okay, you. Thank okay. you. Bye -bye. See you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.